everyone. How are you all? You all with me? Nice. So I'm Karen, and I am completely gobsmacked that I'm actually here um, to you guys. I, uh, Maria was showing me around the office when I came in, and I was like, I'm at Mecca, right? Like, I was, so, um, so I was, I'm so honored to be here, and I was so excited um, when I got the call um, saying, you know, we'd like you to speak to Getty. And I was a little confused at first, and then I thought, well, I'm a photographer. Clearly, they have finally discovered me. Um, <laughs> And, and, and rightfully so, I thought. And then the person on the other end of the line said, um, yeah, no, we don't want you to talk about photography, <laughs> please. Um, we would rather that you talked about, um, you know, innovation and creativity and engendering sort of an innovative spirit. And I thought, well, you know what, actually, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, and not because I'm a photographer uh, at all, but my past life, uh, I was a lawyer. And I was a lawyer for um, at a, a software company that at the time, was the leading software company in oil and gas. Um, I live in Texas and Houston, so pretty much it's either medicine or, or oil. So here I am. And, um, and I, I ended up being the general counsel of, of that organization. And of course, you get to see sort of a lot of innovation software. It's tech, so you tend to see a lot of that. I really got to understand that, um, that really innovative companies while it helps to have a leader with vision, and I, I absolutely, that's huge, um, it also helps if people sort of have a creative spirit and they sort of believe that they are um, capable of amazing things. So there's that. And then I ended up um, quitting my job, and uh, I decided I was going to become a full-time writer and a photographer, and I'm a blogger, and you know, yada, yada, like everybody else is doing nowadays. And I ended up writing um, this book called The Beauty of Different, Observations of a Confident Misfit. And the reason I wrote this book was because I kind of became really uh, intrigued by how most of us hate to stand out, to call attention to ourselves, right? We um, don't like to be different. We don't want to be different. Oh, there's nothing special about me. I'm just me, right? At the same time, we love watching people who are different and do it to great effect. Exhibit A, Lady Gaga, right? I mean, like Lady Gaga, who, you know, great singer, great pianist, great. But there's lots of great singers and great pianists out there, but not all of, the, all of them wear meat dresses or Kermit the Frog outfits, right? And we, we're intrigued by this, that sort of this unapologetic way that she is who she is. And I wanted to kind of explore that, these people who have these sort of really different things about them and are unapologetic about it and live this sort of fabulousness that they, you know, this superpower that they have. Um, and how yet we're all sort of, uh, not me. And I wanted to kind of um, explore that. So the book actually talks a lot, I interviewed a lot of people um, who I felt lived this. At the same time that I was writing this book, I also started a personal challenge um, of, I love faces, I love taking photographs of faces, and I decided that I wanted to photograph a thousand faces. Um, but I started really, really believing that everybody is really, really beautiful, um, and not in a you know, platitude way. Like, I was shooting these faces, and I'm talking to these people, and I'm getting to know them, and I'm like, you know, we are, we're really lucky to live on a planet where there's so much diversity um, on this planet. And there's so much amazing stuff that's on this planet. And so those two things, I was like, you know, th there's something here. So based on that, based on the law job, the book writing, photographing these faces, I kind of figured out a list of things that I think that make people extraordinary. And so with your permission, I'm going to race through sort of my top seven things on how to be extraordinary. You with me? Yeah? Still awake? Good? All right, cool. All right, so um, let's start with the very, very first thing. Just out of curiosity, um, the first one is practice seeing. How many people here are photographers? And by saying photographers, I don't mean licensed with Getty or even get paid for your, your work, but have a camera, like to shoot. Nice. Love that. All right, great. So you don't need me to tell you then that uh, when you are taking a photograph, um, of course, the subject is important, but probably even more important is the light, right? Like, it's all 
about the light. That's the trick, right? That, that to me t is the trick between somebody who really doesn't know anything about photography and somebody who's getting a hang of it, right? They figured out, look for the light. And how many people look for the light even if they don't have the camera in their hand? A few. Like, I, I tend to, like, I'm looking and going, oh, natural light's coming in over there and the contrast. Like, I, I do it a lot. And as a photographer, you tend to do that, right? Fair enough. So I'm shooting all of those thousand faces. And, um, and the way I shoot a portrait is I don't tend to, um, like, I don't use studio lights or anything. And I don't tend to sit. I'll, I'll be like, OK, I want to shoot. I'm going to sh take your photograph. And then I just start talking. And I'm clicking, it's almost sports mode. Yeah, and I'm making people laugh, and I'm talking in real, tell me about your life. And I'm just click, 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 click. And maybe some of you have seen this. There comes a moment when you're doing that that people sort of forget the camera, right? You're in the conversation and stuff. And the pose starts to fall away, right? And you actually start to see the spirit of the person in there. And I really feel like there's, that's light, right? Like there's, there's something that you all of a sudden catch, especially if you shoot a lot. And I always end up with a picture that the person who I'm shooting goes, oh, yeah, that, wow, that's me. That's definitely, that feels like me, right? And, and you've seen that. Like, you've seen pictures of yourself. You're like, oh, that's totally me. Or you've seen some, you're like, I don't even want to know who that person is. Please don't ever point a camera in my direction again, right? And I think that when you start really practicing seeing, and I don't think you need a camera to see it. Like, you can watch people while they're in your conversation with you, while they talk about something they're passionate about, talk about people they love. You can see, like, changes happen in their face. And I think you, we need to practice seeing that, because I think when we start to practice seeing that, we start to believe it of ourselves, right? Because that's, that's the beauty, right? That, it's that spirit, it's that light that comes in. So, First one, practice seeing, very similar, very simple. Still with me? Give me an amen. 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 amen, all right, awesome. All right, we're gonna have to go to church here now, all right? The second thing, which is kind of hard after you start looking at all these people, is stop comparing, right? Um, and I, this was one that was actually taught to me by somebody who was in my book, um, and she is somebody I used to work for, I work with. Um, so the company, um, I told you, software company, very innovative. It was actually a subsidiary of a much larger bigger organization that you guys probably have never heard of, Halliburton? Yeah, OK, um, which is a whole other talk, right? We won't, we won't get into that. But um, so I work, we worked for this company, and she, both of us actually ended up eventually uh, going into Halliburton. And Halliburton, God bless them, um, when it comes to diversity, uh, they pretty much mean a white guy from Texas working with a white guy from Oklahoma, right? Like. It, <laughs> There's not a whole lot of diversity that goes on in the home office, right? And my friend is, was a geologist, and she was very little. Well, she was a woman, first of all, which there weren't a lot of women geologists there at the time. This is probably 10 years ago. And um, she was English, so that made her stand out as well. She had purple hair and blue glasses, and she was unapologetic. She probably lived in, in the United States for like 20 years, and no American accent. Like, she was East End London English, right? And um, fabulous girl. And she ended up doing really well in the company, which was kind of a shock. And during the, um, during the whole thing where you may have heard about Halliburton during the bush Kerry campaign, when Halliburton's um, image was in the toilet, they actually ran a series of ads, of national ads, to kind of pump up their image. And they used her, which I thought was so interesting, because trust me, she was the only person <laughs> like that in the company. And so I asked her when, I when we were doing this, and I said, you know, I love how you're kind of unapologetically you. And so she, I mean, she's brilliant, brilliant geologist. And I'm like, don't you ever like look around and think, I need to tone this down a bit? Like I need to dye my hair a color that occurs in nature and you know, like, you know. And, and she was, I mean, she, she's, real, she's literally one of my very close friends. I'm like, how, how, do you, how do you get to the point where you're just like, I'm not gonna conform? And she said, you know what, I learned a long time ago that um, when I try to compare, and I thought this was so great, she goes, when I compare myself to somebody else, um, that's really me comparing my insides with their outsides. And I thought, that's really brilliant, right? That any time we start comparing ourselves, whether it's, you know, whether it's appearance or whether it's work or whatever else, that a lot of times what we're doing is we're comparing how we feel about what we are doing to how we perceive somebody else is doing without knowing what, how they feel about what they're doing, right? There's no logic in that. So um, she's like, I just don't compare anymore. I just do my thing, um, which is great. Now, that said, um, 
I want to make it very clear that I think that there's a difference between um, comparing yourself with someone and being inspired by someone. And I think ins inspiration is a good thing, all right? So here's how I define it. When, when you compare yourself with someone, it feels bad. I'm never gonna be that smart. I'm never gonna be that good looking. I'm never gonna be that creative. I'm never gonna live like that. I'm never gonna have that house, have that car, have that spouse, have that whatever, right? And it's all, I'm not ever going to be worthy of those things. That's bad, stop that, don't do that, all right? Inspiration is, that is so cool how they do that, I bet I could do that. That is so cool how that person has achieved this, I'm gonna try to do that. It inspires, it energizes, right? Inspiration good, comparison bad. With me? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Amen, all right, let's keep going, all right. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about, journal, read, collect often things. I'm gonna tell you, hang on one second, hang on. Um, so this is my journal. I am a huge, huge journaler, and I am a new journaler. Even though I've been a blogger for forever, this is, journaling is a very, very new thing for me. Um, and I was very reluctant to it. I had a friend who was a writer um, and had this beautiful journal. And I always thought that journaling was sort of um, self-absorbed, um, a little pathetic. Dear diary, really? Um, uh, and I thought that in order to do it right, like to do it well, you probably had to be a young Jewish girl hiding in an attic from the Nazis. <laughs> like, that's really the only way to journal. Otherwise, why even try, right? Um, and so I, was, I told this friend this, who had this really amazing journal, and uh, she just kind of looked at me and was like, I really think you're doing it wrong, right? Um, and I'm like, all right, so tell me how you do it. So I'm gonna tell you how I journal, uh, because I've become a total evangelist, and I do this every day. So, Anybody here ever read um, Julia Cameron, The Artist Way? Is that some, a couple of people? Okay. Um, so Julia Cameron writes this book, and it's about being an artist and being creative. And she suggests that you write these morning pages, and I do this. She suggests three days. Three, I'm sorry, three pages. Every day, I do two pages, I cheat. Um, and literally, it's you wake up in the morning and just spill. You don't worry about grammar, you don't worry about anything. You just, stream of consciousness. Wow, I can't believe, oh gosh, you know, I woke up this morning, didn't know where I was. Oh, I'm in New York, that's right, I'm speaking at Getty today. I cannot believe they asked me to call to, to speak to them. Are you kidding me? They're like the mecca of photography, and I just do that. You know what, I need to shoot today. I haven't shot today. And then when I get home, oh my God, I have no milk. We need to make sure, and literally, just stream of consciousness. And now I don't know what to say. Okay, I still don't know what to say. Okay, I still don't know what to say. This isn't, literally just spill, all right, spill. All right, you're just nothing else, right? And then for me, my third page is a to-do list. And I try to do all of this, by the way, without turning on my computer. Because if you're anything like me, your email will dictate what you're doing for the day. And I really try hard not to do that. I'm like, you know what, I really wanna set my own priorities of what's important for me to do today. And then I'll turn on the email and amend if necessary. But I wanna do that. And then, the next thing that I do is I keep this thing with me all day long, right? So if I get a phone call, that I need to take a message from my husband, I write it down. If I am out somewhere and a song that I like comes over the thing, I'm like, oh, I love that music. Is that a new artist? I write it down. Dry cleaning bills go in here. Um, everything goes in here. And here's what it is. First of all, when you write like that, it becomes less precious. You don't have to worry about, will somebody read my deepest, darkest secrets? My husband could read this and he will get way bored before he ever gets to deep dark secrets, right? Because I'm talking about grocery lists and whatever else is in it. But what's cool about it is it's, first of all, when you write like that and you just put everything in it, you kind of become an interested witness to your own life, right? So you start when you go back and go, oh, that idea kind of came in, or I'm struggling with this issue, and, but now I've written it down and I can look at that like a best friend. Have you, have you ever had that? Like you have a best friend that has this horrible, horrible thing that they're going through and you're like, oh, that's easy, here's what you do, right? But then you're going through something difficult and you're like, I, my life is a mess, right? A lot of ways that makes you be your best friend, right? You can go back and go, oh, it's, it's all of a sudden so clear what I need to do. Or the genesis of a really great idea is in there. And it's chronological, because you just do it on every, you know, like, so you can find things, you can find numbers, you can find ideas, you find a quote, a bit of graffiti that was funny, you write it down. Everything I write is in this, right? Oh, and then the other thing that I do, I'm just gonna show you. you. Guys use camera phones? Okay, so I use my camera phone as a gratitude practice um, to what Jonathan says. I, there's a 
thing about mindfulness and being grateful for your life, I swear to God, it is the key to a joyful life, right? Is you sit there and you make sure that you have a practice of being grateful of what's in your life. And a camera phone is a great thing to do this because we tend to take photographs of things that make us happy or things that make us laugh. We don't tend to think, oh, look at the horrible rain. Or you like, we, you know, we're not Debbie Downers, right? Like, like we, we tend to do that. And then like once a month or so, like I print them out. Because when's the last time you printed out a camera phone photo? Right, you never do. So like I literally, I, I print them out and I just glue them on just regular paper because it's a camera phone, who cares? I went to Paris recently, so. Um, and just write what it was about that day that made me grateful, why I took that picture. And just whatever free pages, right? And it's cool because then you have this like really cool thing later on, but you just never know how that's gonna inspire you. Maybe you take pictures instead of gratitude, although I love gratitude, but things that inspire you, you see something that you're like, oh, I really love how that looks, I love that design, I love whatever, and just put it in there, right? And actually have a record for it. Still with me. All right, let's keep moving. All right, um, okay, so this next thing, name what lights you up. This is actually something that I did right when I quit my job as a lawyer and decided to become a writer and a photographer. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I sort of was like, uh, well, I mean, I know I like photography. And I like photography. You know, and I think people were like, oh, so you're gonna be a photographer? I'm like, yeah, okay. And they're like, so you're gonna shoot weddings? Well, I guess, right? That's what photographers do, right? Like, there wasn't anything really concrete. And so I quit my job, and it was the first time I'd ever quit a job and had no plan. Like, I'm like, I'm gonna go be awesome, right? Whatever that is. So I sat down one day, and I literally made a list of everything I love to do, and I really challenge you to do this. Everything you love to do. I love to give talks, public talks. I love, um, I love writing contracts, it's true, I really did love that in my previous job. I hated reading them, loved writing them, right? I love um, singing in the shower, loudly, good acoustics, usually in a bathroom. I love, let's see if this, I love taking my daughter's Elmer's glue and spreading it over my palm and letting it dry and peeling it off. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, y'all know you like it too, right? So I literally put lists Everything, I love to read, I love to travel, I love whatever else. And I made this list, exhaustive list, okay? Then what I did was after I wrote this list, I came up with like 30 minutes of everything I thought I loved to do. I went back on each thing and I thought, why do I love to do that? What is it about that thing that I love? So I love to read. Why do I love to read? Well, I love to read because I love to watch how authors use language. And so I added that to this. I love to watch how, I love to look at how authors do language. And what I started to figure out was that the things that I love to do were not necessarily for the same reasons that people who love to do those things love to do them, right? Some people like to read because they just want to escape, right? So just, I wrote it down. I love to cook. Some people might love to cook because of the chemistry of cooking. Others might love to cook because it means gathering friends, right? Everybody has a different reason. And what ended up happening was I started to see patterns, right? I love to read out loud to my daughter. Well, because I love doing the voices of the characters or something, right? And it, for me, it turned out that the patterns ended up being like falling into three categories for me. It might be four for some people, it might be two, it might be one. For me, I love speaking, I love writing, and I love shooting. And I love, by the way, that I can say shooting here and you guys know what I'm talking about, because in <laughs> Texas, they always think I mean a gun, right? So, so this is like the first time I'm like, I don't have to explain what that means, right? So, and for me, that's what it is. And I decided I was going to do that, those three things. And I remember getting all caught up, like, what is my title? Like, I need a title for a business card. A, there's no speaker, writer, shooter, what is that, right? <laughs> and I decided, you know what, I'm not gonna go with a title. I'm just gonna go open myself up to opportunities to do that as often as possible. Those three things for me, as often as possible. Preferably two at the same time. So like for this, I consider this sort of shooting and talking, shooting and speaking, right? Because, so whatever, right? Because I think life's too short. Now, I was doing a career change. That was my thing. But I don't think necessarily that means a career change. I think it just means one, do them as often as possible because these are the things that you're motivated by, right? And life is too short, you should be doing that. But also see if there's a way that you can incorporate those things, because I think those might be your superpowers, into how you do your work, right? And I think when you become really clear, these are what I love to do. Like, for example, as a lawyer, I was writing contracts and stuff like that, but one of the things that I loved doing, loved doing, was I was responsible for the companies teaching them about 
code of business conduct, professional responsibility. And I would travel around the world training employees about that. Well, it was great because I could do speaking and shooting if I wanted to put together the presentation that way. And so find ways to harness those superpowers. Yeah, with me? Let's move it. Let's keep going. All right. Um, make life happen. So uh, how many people here know what a bucket list is? OK, we're not going to talk about bucket lists. We're going to talk about life lists. I like to call it a life list. So a bucket list, for people who may not know, is a list of things that you need to do before you die, which I think is really morbid, right? Like, oh, I can't die tomorrow. I've still got 20 more things to do. Like, to me, it's a little, a little morbid. What I like to do is I have a life list. And it's a list of things that I want to do someday. Maybe not get up to all of them. And I like to. I liken it to a menu. So like, if you think of your favorite restaurant, the one that you tend to go to all the time if you have a chance, you probably don't eat everything on the menu, right? You probably have some favorites. Maybe sometimes you want to try some, but you're not going to feel bad if you've not tasted every item on the menu. And that's what my life list is. And so I have this life list, and it has things on it like um, I scuba dive. So uh, scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef is on my life list. Um, Drive an 18-wheeler, preferably not on the road, because that will kill somebody, but just like feel what that's like. Um, I had hand churn ice cream, because I had all these memories of when I was a kid, of, you know, in summertime, or actually in the Caribbean. I'm from the Caribbean, so it's any part of the year. And you're cranking, and you're like, Dad, is it ready yet? You know, shut up, kid, keep cranking. You know, like those lovely memories. And I wanted to do that for my kid. And so I have this, I have this whole list. I have about 100 things on this list, right? Um, and I'm doing some of it. Oh, uh, uh, wear a red dress and s sit on a grand piano in a jazz bar and sing jazz? Because why the hell not, right? Come on, you know? It's just whatever, just get crazy stuff, make friendship bracelets. I'd never learned how to do that as a kid, so that was one I wanted to do. Um, learn how to cook really good Trinidadian food, whatever, because I'm from Trinidad, whatever it is, right? Here's what's cool. So what's amazing is the shot of awesome that you get when you finally do do something. And also, it's really, it's really empowering just to write the thing down. And I strongly recommend you write it down, because I think a lot of us kind of have an idea of, oh, that'd be cool to do, but we don't ever write it down. But it's really empowering. And then when an opportunity opens up, you go, dude, I wrote that down. I really should do this. One for me was write a hot air balloon. I was like, um, I'm afraid of heights. But I thought, I really kind of want to experience that anyway. And then I was in Park City, Utah. And I thought, criminy. I'm in one of the most beautiful spots in the world. I've got a morning free. I wrote it down. Let's see. Now, if I were really scared, I wouldn't do it. That's the other thing. It should never make you feel bad. So if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Like, don't do it. But it's just a way to kind of inspire yourself and also to create this amazing tapestry of experience that you can draw from in your life and in your creative life. All right? So, oh, and the other thing is you don't put anything on there that make, would make you feel bad. So like, lose 20 pounds is nowhere on my list, right? Because I don't want to feel bad if I never do it. Like, it's literally about stuff like, if I get to it, awesome. If I don't get to it, no big deal, all right? With me? Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, let's keep going. Um, this was on that trip that I just told you about. That's not my balloon. Mine hadn't got up yet. So, um, travel. Um, I am a huge proponent of travel. I think travel is especially nowadays imperative. I think the world is shrinking. Don't you think the world is shrinking? Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm not young. I'm, I'm 45 years I'm, I'll tell you. I will tell you. I'm 45 years old. And uh, I think about, like, when I was a kid, we had pen pals, right? I don't know if you all, and like, you would write somebody in, like, Botswana, and it would take, like, three hours, I mean, three years to get there, and then they finally write you back, and, or whatever else. And now, like, my kid emails people in front, you know, like, you could instant message people on the other side of the planet, right? Like the world is getting so small, so small. And I think travel, I mean, yeah, of course you travel because of adventure and because it's fun and cool, but I think there's a couple of reasons why it's particularly important for creative people. One is when you take yourself out of the society that tells you this is how it's done, and put yourself in another society where they seem to do things differently and it works, right? You start to think, well, maybe I could tweak things. Like you start to think, it's working over here in Indonesia, right? So why not here? This, and it just it expands your mind. It makes you more compassionate. It makes you more um, empathetic. It makes you, 
It's, it educates you, and education is always a good thing. Now, not everybody can pick up and go to Botswana or wherever, but you can go to the next state, right? You can get in a car and go to the next state. It's, I mean, especially in people like who work at a successful company, like you got to, you can go, 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 go visit, go, go live, go, go see things, you know? I, and I'm really, really passionate about it. And I, I've loved, I've always loved travel, but like now that I have a daughter, I find myself particularly, um, particularly focused on it. And I, I mentioned I'm from the Caribbean. My husband's English. My daughter's American. So we kind of have travel built in anyway. If she wants to see our families, we have to do that. But I also feel like she needs to really understand cultures. Because if her world is so much smaller than my world was as a child, when she's finally out there working, how small is the world going to be then? Right? We're going to like beam ourselves to different countries or something, right, by the time she's out there. So I'm really, really big on that. And I'm almost done. You all still with me? Almost done. We're almost there. All right. Um, create your own story. So this was something that um, somebody that is in my book taught me. This is a, a friend of mine. Her name is Lori. And she's one of those people that walks in a room and just commands attention, right? She walks in and leaves awake in a good way, right? Heads turn. Um, she speaks and, you know, everybody, she's like E.F. Hutton, right? Everybody listens to her. And uh, I remember I was at interviewing her for my book. And the thing that makes her, it makes this particularly interesting is she has a cleft palate. Um, and, a, a, you know, corrected cleft palate. But she's pretty asymmetrical, right? And, uh, but she's like, she walks in like she's a supermodel. And I asked her, I said, you know, um, so here's the thing. Like, some people get a pimple and they want to hide for a week, right? Like if you have a scar on your face and you're so confident and you're so comfortable in your own skin. I'm like, how did you get that way? Because, I mean, is it your parents? Like what was that? You know, she goes, well, I, I did have very supportive parents that were very, very cool. Um, but, you know, I had a hard childhood. Like I had kids that picked on me and made fun of me and all this other stuff. But I finally, she goes, I don't remember exactly what it was. It was probably like right after college. I decided that I was going to create my own story, and I wasn't going to let other people create it for me. And my story was that I'm beautiful. And if you don't see it, well, you're not looking. Right? And that was really sort of how she kind of lived her life. And I thought, that is so brilliant. And it's an e it sounds easy, right? It's, and it's not. Like, you can sit there and go, yeah, but the, she's just confident, and I'm not, you know? You know, but I do think that if you do take the time to sort of figure out what your superpowers are, right? Figure out what it is that you light, lights you up, those light words that I talked about. You do start using those to get really, really comfortable and good at it because you know those are the things that are sort of the things that make you want to do that. You start doing that to help other people, help people, help coworkers, help people who are needy, help people out there. You start using it for stuff. Like, you start to believe you're pretty damn extraordinary because you are, right? And you become your, best, your own best PR. And I think when you start to do that, when you start to broaden those experiences and you go out there and you're really, really doing these things that light you up, not only do you start to believe in yourself, as you start to believe, wow, I'm pretty hot shit, right? Well, not only do you do that, also, like, coworkers notice it, bosses notice it, right? People notice it because people love passionate people. People love people who love what they do and who love their lives. So my challenge to you, um, since we're ending with challenges, is uh, to, to create your own story and to go out there and do a lot of, like, do some introspection. That exercise that I told you about, um, I actually have done that with a lot of people, with hundreds of people at this point, and I've literally had people come in and said, that has changed my life. It has changed how I operate. Um, I had one woman that told me that she was, she works at, I think she worked at Walmart, I think. She was an executive in Walmart. And she's like, I've started all of these initiatives based on my light words within Walmart, and they're listening to me. Because people get it. Like, people get, oh, wait, this is really her passion. And we want passionate people here at this company because it's going to change things. So um, that's pretty much all I've got. So thank you. Say amen. Yeah.